Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Australian Society for Microbiology public lecture. Um, this lecture kickstarts the annual ASM meeting uh, with current circumstances in Victoria requiring it to go fully online. So a little bit different to what was anticipated for the meeting. Uh, a little disappointed myself, I would have been in Melbourne right at this moment uh, had it not been for that. So instead I'm, I'm zooming uh, from home uh, more or less in solidarity with all of my Melbourne colleagues. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure and honor uh, to be introducing today's speaker and that's Professor Peter Doherty. Uh, Peter is a graduate of the University of Queensland. Peter, I had to uh, get that one in at least. Uh, shared the 1996 Nobel Prize for Immunology and was Australian of the Year in 1997. Since handing over the reins of laboratory science, Peter has continued to be a mentor for many and an active and passionate science communicator, as I'm sure many of you are well aware. He's published six books, uh, countless blog and online articles, engaged proactively with uh, the media and is an avid tweeter. In the time of COVID, Peter has been a voice of reason and wisdom in the almost constant media coverage. Um, he's enlightened us on everything from the immunology of infection to vaccines to the opening time of uh, Dan Murphy's. <laughs> uh, today, he's going to be talking to us about uh, a very topical uh, subject, particularly for my colleagues in Victoria, and that's uh, uh, that's COVID and uh, pandemics more generally. Uh, can I just, before I hand over to Peter, just point out to folks, if you've got a question, please feel free to ask. But on the live stream, you will see, ask a question. Please place it there. So Peter, over to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Paul. Um, with respect to Dan Murphy's, I've had one glass of champagne over the last two months. <laughs> so I'm being, being very abstemious, which uh, uh, suits, suits my age, as I'm now 80 years old. And I'm a proud graduate of the University of Queensland. And it's been wonderful to see the University of Queensland emerge as a major research university, which it certainly wasn't when I was there way, way back. Now, um, I'm at the, uh, the, the Doherty Institute in Melbourne. You can see a picture of that there. It's an unusual uh, model for Australia in that we have bought the academic university department of microbiology and immunology, uh, which is very strong together with the public health activities that are funded by the state of Victoria, basically the diagnostic virology and microbiology laboratories, and uh, also the World Health Organization Influenza Center. And we also house the doctors who do infectious disease work across the street at Royal Melbourne Hospital. We don't have patients in the building, but, uh, but it's basically a research building. Uh, it's worked well, and uh, it's been a great uh, uh, experience to work with all my colleagues who are in those different areas and to see them switch to COVID-19 because that's what's happened. People have switched out of what they usually do, and they're doing COVID-19 research and have been very effective and diagnostics. Now, we're all familiar with the fact that this has likely come from bats. Uh, the coronavirus, you see the picture, we've all seen those with the corona that gives it its name on top. That, was, that name was given by a, a Scottish electron microscopist, June Almeida, back in the 1960s to this group of viruses. And uh, of course it comes in from outside. So this is not the most terrible pandemic human beings have ever experienced. If you go back to the Black Death in England in the, in the 14th, 15th century, and it went on for hundreds of years actually through Europe, you have a, a bacterial disease which kills a half to a third of the people in cities. Now, of course, we handle bacterial diseases pretty well with antibiotics, though we worry about antibiotic resistance. But there was no understanding of infection before the mid 19th century until Louis, Louis Pasteur and people like Koch and so forth came along. So people had all sorts of theories and uh, uh, people were blamed. We always love to blame other people. That's part of the human condition and uh, terrible things were done. Uh, we put a lot of that behind us, but viruses are still a major issue. You can't have, we don't have broad spectrum drugs uh, to quite the extent we have with bacteria. Um, all the time now in modern society, we're seeing new infectious diseases come across into us from nature. And that's probably always happened. But of course, we now have 
nine times as many people on the planet as we did at the turn of the 18th, 17th, uh, 18th century. So there's a lot more people around and they're putting a lot more pressure on wildlife. And of course, international air travel gets viruses around the planet very quickly. So we're constantly being challenged by these things. And of course, the one we have in mind is the original SARS virus, which came across in 2003. That formed the basis of this movie, uh, Contagion, which if you haven't seen it, is, is worth seeing. Much of it is very realistic. It's, that's why it didn't do very well at the box office. It's too realistic. And, uh, and, and the only bit that's not realistic is they get a vaccine out within, within days of actually uh, working out how to make one. With COVID-19, as soon as the virus sequence was announced back in January, people started making vaccine product. But because of all the trials that are necessary and all the approvals and so forth, as we are aware, vaccine didn't really begin to roll out for almost a year. And of course, uh, we've been a bit slower than that in Australia. Um, now, there are a number of viruses carried by fruit bats and insectivorous bats, the coronaviruses, uh, like Cove one in 2002-2003, the MERS coronavirus. This goes from uh, bats to camels to us, we believe. It's very lethal. It kills about 30% of the people it infects. Unfortunately, it's not that infectious, but it is still circulating around in the Middle East, never really got further than Asia, and uh, fortunately has remained uh, relatively restricted in range. We do have two common, new common cold coronaviruses. We've known about the coronaviruses since the 1960s as causes of the common cold. We have two more of them found in uh, 2004. Uh, at least one of them may have been circulating in the longer term. And then of course we have COVID-2 circulating. At the moment, we have uh, basically five coronaviruses circulating in the human population. Before 2000, we only knew of two circulating in the human population. I think international air travel and increasing travel from Asia has probably uh, contributed uh, to some of that increase. Uh, other viruses carried by fruit bats, of course, we know the Nipah virus and Hendra virus, we're familiar with in Australia and Southeast Asia, and likely the, uh, uh, the, the Ebola virus in, in, in Africa. So bats are a, a, gr a great reservoir for inf virus infections. There are various reasons for that, which I won't go into. Cove 2 here we are, the uh, a familiar picture. Um, the spike glycoprotein is the one we're interested in, that uh, a yellow thing that looks a bit like some sort of vegetable on the surface of the virus. That's, uh, that's what all the vaccines are made against. So when people are making a vaccine, the vaccines we're talking about, like the AstraZeneca and the uh, Pfizer vaccine, this is all made solely against that spike protein. All the rest of the virus has, is not in the vaccine. When you hear about killed vaccines, like some of the Chinese and Indian ones, what you've done is grow up the whole virus and kill the virus. And that, that means you've got all these viral proteins that, uh, that are in the virus and our immune system is responding to them. And at least as far as that antibody response goes, which is the main basis of vaccination, a lot of that response is essentially useless. So the vaccines, in fact, in many ways are better, much better at uh, promoting immunity than the actual infection itself. We also know the infection itself is doing some things to the immune system, which make it less effective than it could be, with that being very prominent in some individuals. And uh, the vaccines are doing a better job. So it's much better in terms of protection and herd immunity. We're probably much, much better, apart from any, any consideration of not killing people. We're much better to go for vaccination rather than infection. There was a lot of confusion about that early on with some politicians and, and still in Brazil talking about herd immunity due to infection. That would, that's a very unproductive way to go, in fact. Um, COVID-19 itself, uh, from the point of view of a scientist like me, does offer some unique opportunities because we've handled this uniquely. We've never worked with a pandemic or even an epidemic situation like this before. What's unique about it is we diagnose everybody who cares to show up, at least in Australia, for a PCR test. 
This is a very sensitive, very specific test. And of course, we're testing broadly in Australia, in, in Victoria at the moment. We're doing 40, 50,000 tests a day. So a lot of the cases you hear about may be cases that are simply people who are testing positive very early in the infection. We've never done this with any virus infection before. We, we're detecting people who don't ever develop symptoms, which can be the case, or develop only very mild symptoms, which would never register on the medical uh, uh, um, notification system. So we have this extraordinary resource of people who tested positive, some with no real symptoms, some with later symptoms, this long haul phenomenon that comes across. And, uh, and we'll have that available to look at a lot of issues uh, that we uh, haven't understood about virus infections before. So it may be a very powerful way of getting into some other things. I'll say a bit more about that. Also, we've developed this new science because you can take those PCR products, what, what emerges in the PCR, and sequence them. We've developed a whole new field of what we call, uh, 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 what we call uh, um, genomic epidemiology, where we have the sequence of the virus and we apply that immediately to trace whether this particular virus has come from this individual. And there are enough mutations in this virus to do that. So the virus is essentially bar, -togged, bar tagged, if you like, by the mutations. And then you can trace the lineage, where it came from. And that's what's being done very actively now in Victoria as we deal with this latest outbreak. Um, the advantages of having all that information is we will have it in the long term. And it's very important we keep very good records, linking uh, test data with any clinical records and all the rest of it, and those records be available. Sometimes you can have problems with this. We're not the best in the world at actually getting all our records together in Australia, partly because of the state-based uh, problems and so forth. We do have a national medical system uh, and uh, constant efforts are being made to get better with that. But what we'll be able to look at uh, is later autoimmune disease development, for instance, and see whether that relates back to COVID. We'll also be able to, we'll also be developing a much better understanding of some really awful conditions that doctors have been trying to deal with, with no real cause. And that, that's been very frustrating for them and for patients. And so we may be able to trace back because, and look at things like chronic fatigue because it happens in COVID-19, we may develop a much better understanding of what needs to be done with those type of situations, which cause a lot of economic loss and debility. Global situation re COVID-19, you can look up the WHO website, uh, 168 million people uh, recorded as being infected. Even if those numbers are threefold too low, and they're, they're undoubtedly too low, then that still means that less than 10% of the people across the planet have been infected. So if you think we're gonna be out of this quickly and you look at what happens with mutations, especially in populations where there's no real control of infection and the virus is just running rampant and all it needs to do as far as mutation goes to select a mutant is to be more infectious. So that's what's happening at the moment. All these variants are emerging pretty much against a background of large numbers of susceptible people. So all the mutations are doing is make, the ones that emerge is making that variant more infectious. That probably means it's growing more virus. And it's likely as you grow more virus, you're getting more severe disease, which in some cases we clearly are. We're either getting more severe disease or the disease is starting to look different which is the case with this uh, Indian variant we're currently dealing with in, in Victoria. Um, setting against that, uh, we've only given uh, uh, about a billion doses of vaccine so far, one and a half billion doses. Many of those are, are of course, two shots, mainly in the developed world. So we've got a long way to go with getting vaccine out there as well. And of course, with mutants emerging all the time, the question is, what, what, what variants do we make these vaccines against? because we need to go forward to what the virus is doing and try to counter what it's doing. Now, the focus on death statistics has actually greatly underrated the disease problem here. We do have these death rates. Uh, I think published England, England, all England death rate 
about 0.8% of people who get infected, maybe much less than that, but at the most, I think 0.8% of people being infected may die. And of course, that's improved because the doctors have got better at treating it by immunosuppressing some of the, the worst symptoms and by using heparin to stop the blood clotting problem or to limit the blood clotting problem, which is a real problem in COVID. It's a coagulopathy. It's a viremic disease. The virus gets around the body and the blood. That ha doesn't happen with influenza. And that coagulopathy is a real problem. And so heparin helps with that. Exactly the opposite story, of course, from what happens with that AstraZeneca um, rare blood clotting disorder, where giving heparin makes it worse. But if you look at this, look at these, this graph, you see long term survival of people coming out of ICU. These people have been very severely affected. They may have long term heart and lung damage and kidney damage. And their survivability is not great, especially as people get older. And so the death rates that look only at acute mortality are underestimating uh, the numbers of people this virus kills. And beyond that, of course, we have this long haul syndrome that's really problematic. And it can occur in anyone at any age who's infected with this virus. Here's this, uh, a Swedish survey where 11% of those who've still got some sort of symptoms at eight months after having a very mild to, to subclinical initial course, are still suffering some form of debility or problem. So this long haul syndrome is really problematic. People are still trying to work it out, what the incidence is, what to do about it and all the rest of it. There's some indication that vaccinating these people can help them, which would, would tend to suggest we may be getting rid of persistent virus. Uh, and there's a big, big study going on, many studies going on, one massive one where, where people are actually self-reporting, citizen scientists self-reporting, and uh, uh, large numbers are, are reporting severe debility or substantial debility after six months. Now, we've seen these effects with other viruses, not at nearly the same instance, and, uh, and, and this may help us work out this whole chronic fatigue type of complex. There's also persistent mu muscle pain, neuropsychiatric issues, all sorts of things that are really unpleasant for hit, hit productivity and hit livability and people's lives. And so it's important to get vaccinated. It's important, if possible, to avoid getting infected. You don't want to have this disease. It's unpredictable, nasty, can affect people at all ages, and it's changing. It's one of the nastiest infections that I've, I'm familiar with, and I've worked on a lot of different viruses over the years. Immunity, that's our protection. Immunity, the word comes from immunus, which means without tax, refers to soldiers back in Roman times. And, and the tax we, we defeat with immunity is the tax of infection. That's how it's evolved uh, through evolutionary time, to protect organisms from being infected by simpler organisms or viruses, which of course can only grow within the living cells of some other species, including us. And uh, it divides into two lots, innate immunity, which is sort of a very rapid, quick onset, broad spectrum response, pu puts out all sorts of toxic sort of chemicals to try and kill off the bug or the virus or whatever that's coming in and to set certain things up. Very important for setting up our immune response. And when people talk about side effects from vaccination, those acute effects, you know, the sore arm, the headache, the, uh, the muscle pain that you might get at time of infection, what you're talking about is that innate immune response. Now, innate immunity is very important for setting up what we call the adaptive immune response. That's a specific response we're generating with vaccination. And, and if you get a reactogenic response, that if you get a sore arm, if you get a headache, and all the rest of it. Don't feel too badly about it. Just take some Panadol because it does mean you're getting a response and you're, you're, you're uh, maybe making a good antibody response is what we need. Now, all immunity, all adaptive immunity is, is mediated by, by the white blood cells. You know, we've got red and white blood cells. White blood cells are much rarer. There are lots of different types, but the one that's central to all adaptive immunity is a cell called the lymphocyte. Uh, these were first discovered, they're the latest uh, found in terms of what they actually do. They really weren't worked out 
until the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. We didn't know what these white blood cells did, even though we knew about white blood cells since the late, late 19th century. It took a very long time to work out what the lymphocytes did. And, uh, and uh, they give rise to the big antibody forming cells, the plasma cells, which sit around in places like bone marrow and spleen and pump out all these antibodies that circulate in our blood. They were discovered by, or their role was discovered by a lady called Astrid Fagritz way back in 1948. Then Jim Gowans uh, worked out the basis of what lymphocytes do, and our own Jacques Miller, who worked uh, all his, much of his career uh, at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, worked out what a lot of the T cells are doing. And then various other people came into the pattern, uh, including, including, uh, uh, including our own work. Uh, adaptive immunity only goes back in evolutionary time, a fairly short time. 350 million years. Starts with the jawed fishes. It's the basis of immunity uh, 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 that we generate with vaccination. What we're doing is stimulating the adaptive immune response. We're finding the very rare T cells, the ones that I've worked on, the ones that kill off virus infected cells, the, the factory cells that produce new virus, the very rare B cells and so forth that give us our immune response, give us our antibodies. So though we think of antibodies as being molecules that float around in the blood, they are product of cells. So the response is in many sense, a cellular response, and it's a cell-based system. Um, all, all immune effects work really, or mostly work through what we call protein-protein interactions. The, this is an antibody molecule. That's the very specific binding site on the antibody molecule. It binds to a virus protein. This is a typical virus. And you can see the red bits there. That's where the antibody actually binds to the folded structure of the protein. It binds to a conformational in the main, what we call a conformational turn on the protein. This picture is actually from influenza. It's the structural uh, picture that was provided uh, uh, to, by CSRO scientists in Melbourne and, and uh, allowed Mark von Itstein to actually make a drug an antiviral drug called Relenza, which mimics where the antibody binds. Uh, uh, von Itstein, of course, now at, at the Gold Coast at Griffith University. Um, here we see uh, the antibody, uh, how, how it's conceived to be working against COVID-19. We've got the, um, this is a cell here, the, the, the virus itself binds to the ACE2 molecule on cell surface which is an important molecule in the whole uh, um, um, angiotensin type uh, system and so forth. And the virus receptor binding domain would bind to that as, and we block that by sticking an antibody in its path. So we actually, it's actually a, a physical blocking event. So what we're seeing is the microanatomy of actually how an immune response works. These are pictures from structural biology. So when you think about it, a lot of people have agonized about the fact that the vaccines don't prevent all infections. Uh, they may prevent severe disease and they're very good at preventing severe disease. They're not so good at preventing infection. And the problem there is it's really quite hard to keep antibody levels high up here in the nose and mouth and so forth where the initial infection occurs. And it's all a matter of probability, of course. Uh, the antibody molecules don't have any motor that moves REM around. The viruses don't have any motor that moves them around. Uh, the bacteria do have systems that move, they move themselves around in various ways. Viruses don't. So when a virus gets in, it's just moving in the mucus and so forth up in our nose and hoping to hit a cell. And, we're, and we hope that an antibody will also uh, bind to, to that virus. And, and, uh, and stop that happening. So that's kind of a low probability event in some ways. And so it's, 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 it's not surprising. And it's, it's too much to ask, in fact, of vaccines that they would stop all infection. Uh, in fact, most of them don't, not just COVID vaccines. Most, most vaccines don't. It's just we don't normally test for it. So it's all up to numbers and, and interactions. In fact, all the stuff's up to numbers. We also have other questions about the antibodies. We're only making antibodies to the, what we call the receptor binding domain, the little bit that interacts with the ACE2 
and, and get that, of course, then gets the virus into the cell. So we're only making antibodies against that in the main, or that's our main focus. There are also other antibodies made against those spike proteins that maybe don't do that, but could do other things like uh, what, what we call fixing complement, which is a toxic molecule. And if you bind an antibody, you can, you can, um, you can focus that killer system uh, through uh, complement onto a cell. So that could be a factor. There's also a worry very early on that, um, that the antibodies may be, might be making the disease worse. Fortunately, that hasn't shown up. It's a phenomenon called immune enhancement that we're familiar with from dengue virus infections. And also there's been worry about that the, some, the, some of the antibodies may actually help the virus get around the body. Those signals haven't really come through, which is a good thing. And, and actually COVID-19 has been a pretty straightforward uh, immunization target, despite a lot of concerns at the beginning. The, the problem, of course, is as with flu, is that the virus is changing. And, uh, and, and the more it changes, the less effective the vaccines will be. Uh, basically, all vaccines work primarily by antibodies that circulate in the blood. It can spill over into the mucus sites and, uh, and block the virus in question. And that's true of polio and measles and all the rest of it. Polio and measles are both virus infections that depend for severe symptoms the on the virus getting around the body and the blood. And uh, they, they don't change much, fortunately. So the, the vaccines work very, very well in the long term. It's easier to keep antibody levels high in the blood. The, the, the cells that produce the antibodies are sitting in places like bone marrow or spleen, pumping those antibodies out into the blood. So the thing about COVID-19, and I think the reason why our vaccines have 90 percent plus effectiveness, at least against the original strain, at preventing severe disease is, I think, that it's blocking that viremic phase, the phase where the virus can get into the blood, get around the body, get into the heart, the lung, uh, the heart, the kidneys, and into the blood vessel wall cells, the endothelial cells, where we get blood clotting problems, we can get kidney damage, we can get heart damage. These are all the real problems you have with severe COVID-19, apart from an over, over effulgent innate response where you've got lots of cytokines and chemokines and chemokine shock and all that sort of stuff. So I think the reason, part of the reason that COVID-19 vaccines um, work much better than flu vaccines is flu is just a respiratory infection. In humans, it doesn't go systemic. We don't get virus in blood. We don't get distributing blood. This one, I think we're stopping severe disease when we stop the virus in the blood. And antibodies are really good at doing that. So, so in a way, uh, we do better uh, with COVID-19 than we do with flu. Another problem with flu is, of course, we're all well, an actual flu vaccine has four different viruses in it. This is only one virus. Then we may need to extend, we will need to extend that range to cover some of the mutants as we get uh, further down the track in vaccine manufacture and rollout. Um, vaccines, we've kind of been through that. There are various types of vaccines out there. The two we've, we're looking at in Australia are both vaccines that deliver the genetic material to make the spike protein. That's all they deliver. They don't, once they've in, gone into a cell, they don't infect other cells. There's no possibility of transmission. They just put genetic material into the cell and then the immune system can respond to the genetic material from the viruses produced there. The Pfizer vaccine delivers it as mRNA, messenger RNA, so it only ever goes into the cytoplasm. The AstraZeneca vaccine delivered as, as, as DNA packaged in another virus, or, which, do, which is, is, is damaged so that it can't replicate beyond one growth cycle. And the, um, the DNA goes into the nucleus where it makes messenger RNA, which comes back into the cytoplasm and makes the pro spike protein. So they're both working by the same common pathway. They're both targeting exactly the same protein receptor binding domain. And that's why there's a whole lot of stuff. If you look at the conversation this morning, uh, uh, conversation.edu.au, there's a nice little article on people using priming with AstraZeneca, boosting with Pfizer, because they're, they're the same structure that's being seen and you can do this cross prime boost and it seems to be working very well. Maybe we'll, we'll come around to that in Australia.
there, but at the moment it hasn't been approved by the regulatory authorities. Um, both vaccines are highly effective against the original strain. If we look at the virus that's circulating in Melbourne at the moment, it's what's called the B1.0. Uh, uh, and they were effective against that UK variant we were hearing a lot about, which was more highly infectious. The one that's problematic now in the United Kingdom, why the Europeans have shut borders against the United Kingdom, and the one we have in, in Victoria at the moment is what one of the, what we call Indian variants, B1.617. We've got 0.1. The one circulating mainly in the UK is 0.2. Antibodies against these two variants show similar cross neutralization in tissue culture. So we've, the story for them, re-vaccines, is probably about the same. Uh, the vaccines are having some protective effect, uh, but they're not as effective as they were against those original variants. So, and, um, and basically, uh, with two doses of uh, Pfizer, uh, we're getting still up around 88% protection against any disease. Uh, that comes down to about 60% with AstraZeneca against any disease developing. The people who wrote this work, uh, and if you only had one shot of either, it's about 34%. But it's in the paper that the people who, who did this analysis and published this work think that uh, both will, are probably protecting pretty well against severe disease still. And that's, of course, the main concern is severe disease and death. We don't have those figures yet because it hasn't been long enough to get enough cases uh, in the non-vaccinated people, for instance, to see whether that's really true. But the, the, the likelihood, I think, is that these will protect much better against severe disease than they protect just against getting any disease. Because it's just a matter of how quickly the immune response turns on, develops. When you, when you give a vaccine, you're jump-starting the immune response. And if you've given a boost, you've taken it further along. And that, uh, that's why the vaccines are working. So vac vaccination kickstarts immunity, finds those few cells that respond, stimulates them, makes more of them, and switches them into somewhat different differentiation state that uh, will then respond more quickly. A second shot increases the numbers. And uh, you know, as all the virus wants to do and multiply and infect, uh, the more we can turn on rapidly the more rapidly we turn on, and that's what vaccination does, the quicker we get rid of the pathogen. Uh, by vaccinating, uh, my, my take on this is we side with our family and friends and humanity, and we don't side, side with the virus because all the virus wants to do is infect more and more people. And what we want to do is stop it infecting more and more people. Um, this is what happens. You've got very few cells to start with. All goes on in the lymph nodes, these glands in the neck if it's an infection, or the glands in our armpit, what we call the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 those lymph nodes that, that act as this kind of environment, the, the kindergarten, if you like, the preschool, where the immune response gets going and develops. That's where all the multiplication gets going. So when you get uh, some pain here, for instance, after vaccination, it's just that the lymph node is swelling, which gives you some pain because there are pain receptors, and that's what's, what's happening. So here we see a primary response, and we get memory cells coming from that. And then if we give a booster shot, we increase the numbers, and, and we're in better shape, basically, uh, both re, re both prime cells and prime antib and antibodies. Uh, this is uh, actually quantitation of an immune response in the mouse uh, with uh, the primary response showing a lot of diversity in the cells that are responding. Uh, then we get immunological memory. The numbers fall down a bit from that. A lot of the cells that are stimulated acutely actually die off. And then when we boost, either by infection or with a booster vaccine shot, we hit the numbers up again. That's the, what we call the killer T cell response. Uh, not the antibody response, but it's much easier to quantitate that response than it is. Here's the killer T cell response. This is killing off a virus infected cell. There's the killer cell killing a virus infected cell. And when you kill that virus infected cell, and there it is, it's dead, you take out the factory that's producing new virus that will infect other people and, uh, and infect other cells within us. So these killer T cells are involved in actually terminating the infection, that what they recognize, it's a really complicated story, 
And uh, what they're recognizing is that a little bit of the virus peptide, a little peptide, eight, 12 amino acids presented in our transplantation molecules. I really can't, uh, can't go on with describing that because it's far too complicated. But, uh, but if you look at some of the stuff I've been writing online, I've been writing explainers, there's explainers of it. Uh, this is the transplant molecule with, with the viral peptide. Now, the point about this is when we're using only a spike protein response, which we're doing with the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, we're only sampling the peptides from that, that protein. Now, if we had all the virus proteins in our vaccine, we would be getting a much broader range of these uh, killer T cell responses, which might be valuable because what the killer T cells can do, this is virus load in a primary response. You can see the killer T cells turn on and lock, knock it down. Uh, what, what we can do if we primed that up and we had immunological memory, we'd get much quicker virus elimination uh, the second time around. When, if we have, say, someone who's had one or two shots of vaccine is infected, they get some virus growth, but it will knock down much quicker if these T cell responses are primed, even if the antibody doesn't totally handle it. Um, there are very strong uh, responses in the human response to COVID-19. This is a particularly strong one discovered by uh, Catherine Kazerska at our institute. And uh, Catherine and I are long-term colleagues. And, uh, and he, she's looked at the cellular response across the whole response to COVID-19. And we're, that's one of the, the, we're getting, and this is in, all in humans, all in naturally infected people. We're getting a much, much better picture of what happens in this virus infection than we have actually for any infection, including influenza. So COVID-19 is teaching us a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll approach future pandemic viruses in better shape in many ways. And there will be future pandemics, so we can be sure of that. So that's vaccination. The question is, uh, where are we with drugs and, uh, and, and other treatments? Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about vaccination, but we haven't heard much about treatments. What we have heard about is things like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and so forth. That, that the, the story's a bit mixed on ivermectin. Hydroxychloroquine certainly doesn't seem to be very beneficial. Ivermectin, maybe the jury's still out, especially if you use it early, uh, but none of our clinicians are committed to using it, so they're not satisfied with the clinical trials. There's a lot of confusion around it because uh, a lot of people do what's called meta-analysis. What you do is you pull together the results of lots of clinical trials Often they're very badly conducted clinical trials and you can come to quite wrong conclusions. You need proper randomized double-blind clinical trials to really evaluate any drug. And uh, our people particularly are not satisfied unless they can see that data and see some evidence of effect. Treatment with convalescent serum, we hope that would work well early on. Uh, it hasn't worked very well. And the likely reason for that may be that the convalescent serum is pretty expensive, uh, even if you produce lots of it. And if you're going to stop this infection by stopping the virus, you have to give it very early. That's the problem with treating virus infections is you have to get them very early. Uh, with influenza, if you treat them uh, before people get symptoms or right at the time they do, uh, you can actually get a pretty good effect but generally it's too late by the time you come in with the antiviral. And a lot of the antiviral treatments being too late, which is why there's still confusion about some of the repurposed drugs also. So what sort of treatments do we have? Well, apart from the drugs, we have monoclonal antibodies. Most of us are now familiar with the idea of monoclonal antibodies. These are immune cells or the immune, immune information that we put into other cells that produces just a single antibody molecule that's very specific for the virus, and you can use it therapeutically. You may remember that President Trump, when he got infected, was treated with a monoclonal antibody. He was treated early, of course, they were monitoring the president very closely, testing him whenever he showed any symptoms at all, or even uh, perhaps routinely. As soon as he tested positive, and he was sick actually, and a lot of that I think was concealed, they gave him eight grams of a monoclonal antibody, emergency use approval, and that stopped the infection and he got better. 
Whether that's a good thing or not, you can debate, but uh, from the medical point of view, I'm not a medical doctor, so not, I don't have any particular commitment to curing people. But um, first do no harm is not in my lexicon because I trained as a vet. But, um, but basically, uh, they, they probably stopped Trump from getting severe disease. And, uh, and, and, but that, that's a very expensive, very complicated type of therapy. You've got to give it intravenously and uh, you know, very expensive. So how many other uh, senior Republicans had that treatment? I don't know. So what is very interesting though, is there are monoclonal antibodies there and GlaxoSmithKline has one, which this, they have an antibody which actually came from the original SARS, which seems to block all these viruses. So that's an immensely valuable antibody. It's currently going through our Therapeutic Goods Administration uh, for registration and use in Australia. I think it'll be a very valuable thing to have. It's also, their antibody has been engineered, so it survives a long time in the blood. It can survive, I believe, for some months. So that means you could use it either for treatment or you could also use it prophylactically. Say if we had a new variant back virus where the vaccines weren't working at all, we could potentially give frontline people this monoclonal antibody, have it circulating in their blood for a long time and have them protected. And of course, that would be a very expensive thing to do, but uh, we probably should be signed up to at least have some supplies of this in, in stock. Um, it, it, it again blocks binding like any, anybody does. Now, what about actual drugs? We, we apart from the repurposed one, this has taken longer than I personally expected, and I'm, I guess that's because I'm a bit naive about drug development. But there is, it does now look as though there are a couple of drugs coming along. Pfizer has an antiviral going into clinical trial. This is one that stops the protease. The protease is one of those other proteins in the virus, which is necessary for, for chopping up uh, proteins and making the actual virus. So that protease is really important and it's pretty much uh, shared or uh, between the different coronaviruses. So if you make an anti-protease that works, uh, then you could potentially block all the variants which is why the drug is so, so valuable. And this particular drug, they've got it in two forms, one where they were going, giving it intravenously uh, to, uh, to, um, to treat hospitalized patients. That's probably a bit late, I think, but it, the trial certainly needs to be done. And that trial is going ahead in the United States, I think, or probably at different sites around the world. But this drug also has the advantage, you can give it as an oral. So if you can just take it, pop a pill, it's much easier to get people to do that than, of course, to inject them with the monoclonal antibodies, as they had to do with President Trump and, and as you would have to do with, uh, uh, with, with the monoclonals in general. So that's a much more complicated regime uh, to treat people. But if you can just give people a pill, providing it's available, that's a really positive thing. And it which should protect against all these viruses. So we're hoping their phase two, phase, they're going into phase two, maybe phase one, phase two. Now, it'll take some months for this to come through. Come through. It's easier to test a drug than it is to test a vaccine because you can treat people who, gets, who are getting po or either positive or getting sick. Uh, if you're, you're treating a vaccine, you've got to wait for cases to occur in the community to, uh, to pick them up. Uh, and uh, and that, uh, that can be a pretty cumbersome process. So when you're looking at say, the, the, the vaccine being trialed in um, 20,000 people, what you're actually looking at for results may be actually stopping the disease where in the saline control, the placebo group, they got say less than 200 cases. So you're not looking at 10,000 cases being prevented. What you're looking at is, is, um, is, is that number. So, so that's promising, and we hope that drug will go ahead and won't fall down for some reason uh, due to toxicity or some other problem that's not anticipated. Pfizer, of course, are a big drug company. They're used to doing these trials. 
And there's a whole lot of complexity in actually rolling out a product that people like me, who are essentially academics and work with lab mice or, or in the lab with human cells, uh, we're not really that in touch with that stuff. So you need, you, what you have, of course, in science is professionalism at every level. So it's not just the people who dis do discovery science like me, it's also people like Paul who did the introduction, who comes from that culture, uh, but has also been developing vaccines at the University of Queensland. You have to do these things in order to learn how to do it properly. And you just can't assume, uh, and you need people with different skills and a very broad diversity of skills. You need everyone from lawyers to marketing people and all the rest of it to get a vaccine out there, engineers, all sorts of people. So don't think that it's something in the medical sciences is just done by medical sciences. scientists. It's done by all sorts of people who contribute. And firstly, for instance, we've seen uh, people train with PhDs in science and infectious disease, like uh, uh, my training is, uh, who uh, actually then went across and did law degrees and are very important in that in that cap context. And so, so lots of different jobs around this area uh, for people with different types of expertise, and we need all of them. Um, Merck also has a, a ribonucleoside analog. You remember remdesivir. Uh, that's a ribonucleoside analog. Um, remdesivir didn't, it was repurposed. It had been developed uh, for use with Ebola. Uh, didn't prove to be the magic bullet, but again, it was very expensive and in short supply. And maybe if it had been used earlier before people developed symptoms, it might have been much more effective. But of course, uh, with short supply, nobody was going to do that. They were keeping it for the um, uh, people who got sick. And so, uh, again, this may be promising. The only reservation a lot of us have about these ribonucleoside analogs is they are potential mutagens um, because they're, they're changing the uh, virus RNA. So, uh, so there could be a, a, an issue there. Uh, they uh, initially were doing a trial in hospitalized and non-hospitalized people. They dropped their non-hospitalized their hospitalized arm and are only going ahead with the. Uh, uh, the non-hospitalized people, implying that they're going, they want to see this, this used early. In fact, if we want to stop mutant viruses emerging, which escape from these antivirals, you'd probably want to give a couple of them because you don't want mutations emerging that allow them to escape. That's what happens in cancer therapy. You give more than one drug that targets different pathways in the cancer. With HIV, three different drugs that target different pathways in the virus replication. But these antivirals work right across this, the range. And one of the things we should be doing in the long term, even if it doesn't come through with COVID, is developing antiviral drugs, getting them tested with relatively mild forms of the virus and having them ready to go with all those categories of viruses that could potentially cause pandemics. Coronavirus is at the top of our thinking. We do have them for influenza, but we need them for, I think, the viruses, probably the filoviruses, and these other viruses. This is one of the things that we should be doing in the long term, developing antiviral drugs and having them ready to go if we actually need them. If we'd had those drugs, if we'd gone ahead after the first COVID, COVID uh, um, the, the, the SARS-1, we developed those drugs, the people in Wuhan could have handled this very differently if they had those drugs available to treat everyone who tested positive. They might have been able to stop this pandemic in its tracks. And that's what we're going to need to do, stop these pandemics in their tracks at the beginning. Um, and uh, we need proper collaboration globally and regulation and so forth that works. And uh, there are some flaws in what happened here, as, uh, as we know, and that will be, be further worked out. What do we need to open up Australia? Well, it's, it's, it's a tough one, and it's going to be a very tough one for the politicians. Um, we need, I think, at least 70 to 80 percent of the people fully vaccinated, and hopefully with some booster shots against some of the variants. That seems to increase the breadth of the response and more likely to be effective against uh, new variants. My personal view is we also need to have the drugs available. We need those therapeutics to use in positive people. 
and, uh, and to use uh, against variants uh, that, uh, that may be totally unexpected. And so there's monoclonal antibodies and drugs and so forth. It'd be great if we also had them available to treat people. Now, so that's basically uh, where I'm at with this. As Paul said, I haven't been running a laboratory through this, so I've been talking with my colleagues uh, two to three times a week. We have a regular week, weekly meeting where we all come online, talk about what the various groups are doing, what's happening with diagnostics, what's happening in the clinic, what's happening in the people who are doing a virus neutralization test, people who are developing vaccines, people who are developing tests, doing the genomics. So I've been listening to that every week. And my role in this has been largely public communication. I've had a, um, I've been doing a weekly uh, essay for our website, uh, which is an explainer of the science, basically. I haven't been trying to do what the journalists are doing rather well reporting on this. And I think that on the whole, the journalists have done a pretty good job with reporting. But I've been trying to explain the science behind a lot of what's being talked about in really simple terms. I can tell you, I'd always avoided, I've written six books, I've always avoided writing about infection and immunity because it's so complicated. And so now I was forced into it. So there's a book coming out in, um, in August that will have those explainers, but you can go to them online and you can read them. They're out now up to about number 59, I think. And uh, I'll be writing them through the rest of this year as well. And so uh, that book will actually be out in August if people like to read things in print. I did write an earlier book on pandemics. Um, it, it, it was pretty okay, but what I really underestimated was the social and economic aspects of this and how that would be handled. Uh, and so, uh, so it never really sold much because people, it was a kind of book based, it was question and answer, the pandemics for dummies sort of book that basically tried to be reasoned and, and informative and not scare people. But people much prefer to be scared when it comes to reading books about pandemics. So never sold particularly well. And uh, um, though I did get translated into Chinese uh, last year, which rather surprised me. So that's me finished and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Peter. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Um, great coverage. Look, I, there were a number of questions that were appearing um, all the way through your talk, but I might just pick up on uh, on one of the last things you you commented on and go back to an early question uh, when you were talking about contagion as being a not bad rendition of uh, of of, um, of an outcome uh, for a for a virus uh, in in a pandemic setting. What was missed in contagion was the politics of global distribution of vaccines. I guess they didn't get to that point. But, but had, how are we going to address this? How, how are we going to move forward and maybe for next time, move past this vaccine nationalism um, issue? Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough issue. You know, I, I've often thought as I've in, been more engaged, not just with this pandemic, but with public communication of science, uh, that if I, I were to retrain again, I'd retrain as a psychiatrist. And, uh, and to be a psychiatrist who also specializes in global politics would probably be valuable. It's, uh, I mean, Jane Holton, of course, has been a, a very steady and, and sane and sensible voice in this. And, uh, and the WHO uh, trying to get the vaccines out there, all sorts of problems, cost. I mean, one of the advantages of the AstraZeneca was that it's a very cheap vaccine that uh, uh, if they could get around that blood clotting issue, it may still be a viable um, possibility, but, um, but we wouldn't be using it again. We've already had, if, you, if someone's gonna have a prime and boost with this, you really wouldn't wanna be hit with another, another adenovirus that, that could be neutralized by antibodies and so forth. So um, it's, it's a really big problem. It needs a much bigger contribution from the rich countries. But of course, everybody's been um, focusing on getting their own people vaccinated, and that's pretty understandable. So we need different mechanisms. I think we need the capacity to make these vaccines much more widely distributed. The developing world has relied a lot on India. And of course, India has been problematic because they have such a terrible COVID uh, outbreak themselves. Uh, Indonesia was developing a vaccine industry. I don't know where that's at, but they've had to bring in vaccine. I think we need the capacity to make these vaccines under some sort of general agreement uh, around the planet. 
much higher. And I think there's a real possibility for us in Australia to do that. I think we really could do very well to develop a substantial vaccine industry here. We've got great science, science. We've got a public health system. We've got everything that's needed to actually do that. And we've got a good location too. So very, very tough problem. And, uh, and uh, basically it's up to the global bureaucracy and, and all those, uh, those important uh, meetings and so forth that can often be so frustrating. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And particularly the comments you make about uh, local Australian manufacturer. I mean, the other thing we need to, need to build is that uh, pipeline of development from the great discovery science that you talked about. Uh, having yep. it here in Australia through to that manufacturer. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's missing as well. So We've been talking about that for years, but of course, getting the politicians engaged is normally more difficult than it is just at the moment. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you an even more difficult question and, and, and relates to some of the sociological um, issues that you raised a little bit uh, before, and that's around the COVID in the age of Twitter and Facebook. Um, I mean, these social platforms have been great for information dissemination, but also misinformation, uh, particularly over the last four or five years. What, what are your thoughts on how society can deal with this going into the future? I mean, it, it, it seems to me to be presenting a major issue. Yeah, it is, it is a major issue and I've been grappling with it. I, I uh, put a lot of effort into trying to help defend the climate scientists against the climate change deniers. And I read into it a lot. I spent a lot of time talking to these people. I chaired committees where I work with them. I chaired the uh, Climate System Science uh, Center of Excellence for years um, on, on various sustainability things and so forth. So I have no doubt about either the quality of the science, the integrity of the scientists in climate science. But of course, there's been an enormously orchestrated campaign against them, organized particularly by fossil fuel producers and by people who are committed to that neoliberal ideology that says no tax, no regulation. If you're going to deal with climate science, it's going to cost money and it's, uh, climate change is going to cost money and, it, and you need regulation that's enforceable. So it's an enormously difficult one. With COVID, we don't necessarily have that business interest, the, the fossil fuel criminals coming in and, and dis, disseminating, deliberately disseminating disinformation, which is the case for some of the major oil companies which, who knew better right from the beginning. But, um, but we do have the, the whole conspiracy people, the, all that stuff, and they find each other online and propagate these plausible often to people who don't have much sophistication about this uh, stuff that just goes viral. I wrote a book about it in 2015 called The Knowledge Wars, trying to tell people how to interrogate science, both from a point of view of an insider in medical science and an outsider in climate science. How do you interrogate science? How do you know the, who's being fake and who's, who's true? How, how do you try to get to the truth? Because people present themselves as experts when they're actually uh, either corrupt or they know nothing. And of course, we lived through all this with Trump, the whole fake news thing with Trump. That book was published in 2015, so it's pre-Trump. And, uh, and it, it kind of describes this, this, this guy. So, uh, so basically, tremendous complex problem. Again, you know, I thought about psychiatry. So I think we need a lot more people with real insights about how to talk to people. And I tried to talk to people. I try not to disparage people in conversation, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah, thank, I totally, totally agree. It's, a, it's, it's a, a difficult problem, but one we really do need to address into the future. Um, some science questions. Um, do we know, and this relates back to your comments um, earlier in, the, in your talk about, uh, about transmission uh, blocking versus disease blocking uh, effects of the vaccines. Do we know if flu vaccines block transmission? I, I personally, personally, I, I, we don't, I think, and I doubt they do, uh, but they, they will cut it back. Because they would, they, if you're vaccinated, you should, the duration of, of transmission should be reduced. So it's all probabilistic and it's all numbers. You know? So the more people are vaccinated, the more likely you are to hold it, basically. That's where it gets down to. Flu vaccines, I mean, the COVID vaccines, when they came through initially on the, against the Wuhan strain, they were pr protecting uh, the Pfizer and, and Moderna vaccines, something like 90% of people against any disease which is really extraordinary. With flu, we're lucky to average out at about 50%. Uh, 
And you've got four viruses in the flu vaccine, so you may be protecting 50% against one and 75% against another because they never all work as well because the virus keeps changing and you have to decide on the vaccine candidate six months ahead. So, so basically, it's, uh, I, I suspect uh, you, you cut it right back. Certainly with measles, we know that you stop disease uh, with having, say, two doses of vaccine. And, and you probably greatly limit transmission, but, um, but really it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unexplored territory and you need to do what you do with COVID. You need to go out and PCR test everybody. Right. Uh, we're running out of uh, time. So maybe, maybe one last uh, question. Uh, someone's picked up on your commentary around uh, mixed vaccines. Where are we with that? What, um, have, have there been any studies with 617.1 and 2? Uh, or any of the other uh, variants for that matter, or any of the other platform technologies. So where are I, mixed vaccines? Yeah, yeah. I, I, the only mixed vaccine studies I know of have been done with, I think, Pfizer and AstraZeneca. We need to do this more widely. It, it's up to public health authorities and, and so forth uh, and to, to get these things done, I think. So I think the UK and various places have been doing the Pfizer AstraZeneca combination, and they found that that works pretty well. So so that's good, but we need to be doing this with other vaccines as well. Of course, we can model it in in animals and all the rest, but but uh, and you can look at phase one trials and all the rest too. So I think it, it, it it's really a promising strategy to come back with something quite different, and you certainly want to come back with something quite different from AstraZeneca. Uh, you don't want to keep you couldn't keep repeating giving you that adenovirus because I think the reason why it works much better with AstraZeneca if you wait 12 weeks is the level of antibody against the adenovirus, the outer coat is dropping right off. And so you're not getting it handled inappropriately when the second shot is given. And that seems to be good. So uh, we, we should certainly keep to that one for the moment. Okay. Well, it's uh, right on the hour, so uh, probably just remains for us all to give you uh, a virtual applause uh, for, for that great presentation, and, uh, and we can move on. So thanks again very much, Peter. Right. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.